And they do need to hear that this can be healed and you can live a normal, loving, joyful life, right? I remember the last conference I spoke at was American Mental Wellness Association had their debut conference in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And I was asked to speak and I did. And what I found was the majority of the people with the fancy degrees and, you know, MDs behind their name were saying that it couldn't be cured. And I was standing there like, what? <laughs> In evidence to the contrary. I think I think you got that wrong. <laughs> Solidarity sister. Solidarity sister. Deja Lee Labrie is pure light and inspiration. Her childhood was full of unspeakable horrors, including satanic ritual abuse, which led her brain to protect her via over 70 altars. Yet today, Deja Lee stands as one whole person, a witness that healing is possible through physical and creative outlets, therapy, connection, and safe spaces within community, and an insatiable desire to create a joyful life. She has overcome and now shares hope with all who meet her. Deja Lee is a coach and a speaker, and she has a gift for holding space for others who need to be seen as they are and encouraged with love. This conversation really got to the heart of what it means to make room at the table. You are in for a treat. Welcome to another episode of Solidarity Sister with Kristen Wilson. And today I am really excited to bring to you another wonderful guest, Deja Lee Labrie. And... Mm -hmm. I have been working on getting her name correct because we all want to be called by our correct name. That's right. The small thing we can do to show people that we care. Deja Lee has been through some very difficult life experiences, but yet when you look at her and you see the light in her eyes and the joy there and in her smile, you wouldn't realize what she's been through and what brought her to a point of finding so much joy in her life. She's really an inspiration to me and to lots of other people to be able to see what we can overcome and how we can lean into community and lean into the power of becoming centered in ourselves and being able to find joy after difficult things. So welcome. We're so glad to have you here and glad that you would take the time to be with us. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm honored that you had me on your podcast. It's so awesome to to spread the word about joy in this, particularly in this time of the year. Absolutely. No, I appreciate that. So tell me, how are you doing for real? I am really doing well. <laughs> I'm actually excited about life. This has uh, been a, a banner year for me for with a lot of different things. And I'm just excited to be alive in this time and, and spreading the, the word about joy after trauma and all of that. So hopefully we can get some word out there for everybody and, and they'll enjoy this podcast as well. Awesome. I'm so glad. So tell me, what are you listening to lately? Whether it's music you have on or podcasts you love, audio books you've been listening to, what what's in your ear? Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm just like, I'm like a sponge, I, you know, like, you know, when the six year old is just like sponge, I mm -hmm. want everything in my brain. Yeah. Well, that's the way I've been in the last year. And probably more than that, but I'm just going to say in this last year, I, I've gone through David Bedrick's Unshaming Our Lives. I've done David Hopkins, which is Letting Go, a Pathway to Surrender. I've listened and love Kathy Heller as a podcaster and as a mentor. I have a beautiful experience with Debbie Happy Cohen, which she's a founder of Joy Based Living. And she wrote a book called Mother Love, which was in response to, and not necessarily in response to, but it grew out of an understanding that we had about Kelly McDaniel's book called Mother Hunger. And then, I mean, I'm listening to, as far as music, as far as so what soothes my soul, <laughs> Mm -hmm. is music from the 70s, 80s, and nine, some of the 90s. I, I like John Denver. You know, I I like um, basically folk music, but in, I also love classical music. So I, I have a like one end of the spectrum. I'm, I'm into jazz, uh, you know, classical music, 
and country. I like, I'm a country girl. I live in Northern Alabama and I'm not from Alabama, but it so saturates our, <laughs> our music around here. And then you get to know it and you love it. So those are some of the places. And then I, the other thing that I'm listening to and audiobooks are Gay Hendrix books called The Big Leap and Conscious Luck. Those two books are really influential in me right now. And also Mario Martinez. I'm not sure you know who he is, but he is a psychologist, anthropologist, scientist kind of person who studied a lot of, well, really all over the world, studied cultures and came up with three wounding fields and then three antidotes for that. His wounding fields that he found in every culture, whether it was Africa, India, and the United States, were shame, abandonment, and betrayal. And so I've listened to him over and over and over again because I want to really understand what those mean to me in this life. Because for one thing, we get it from our social and our society, our government, our churches, our teachers, we, we get norms that we're supposed to fall into. And then we start shaming ourselves about not falling into it because we want to be our authentic selves. And that doesn't jive with who we are. So that and David Bedrick, they come kind of together in uh, this is what we have and this is how you change that. And so I've begun, you know, I've, I'm into those, if you want to call that into those. So I love that. Well, we'll put a list of links to all of the great things you're learning into our show notes so that if anyone feels inspired by those different descriptions, a lot of those I've heard of or read, but some of them I haven't. So Mm -hmm. it to my interest and I'm always looking for something new. So I appreciate that. Uh What is the most interesting or unusual thing you might have in your purse or car right now? I have for years had what's called an emotional ladder in my car on the visor. It's from Joy Based Living. And basically each day, I have it all over my house actually, but in my car, I have this in my visor so that if I'm in traffic or I'm going somewhere or I'm just having an emotion, which I can name, I can go on this ladder and say, well, it's not in the shame and powerlessness at the bottom. And it's not exactly in the joy, appreciation, freedom, and love at the top. It might be somewhere in the middle of, well, I'm accepting this car jam or I'm accepting my anger at this time. And then I've, I've got courage to move forward. So that's kind of what this is. It's an emotional ladder and it's, yeah. it's from joy-based living. All emotions are accepted. You know, in my in my life, I've realized that instead of trying to erase my emotions, I've allowed them to flow through me. It's like they say, you don't stand in the same river twice you know, let, let the emotions flow through you. Otherwise you really get stuck. Cause it's like putting a boulder in the middle of the river and the dam is like all of that emotion is stuffing into yourself. And then finally you have to let it go. And it's like a whoa, explosion waterfall, you know? And so I've learned to just allow those feelings to flow through me and it sure feels a lot better. <laughs> No, it does. And, you know, I love Brene Brown. I'm a huge Brene Brown fan. And she talks a lot about feeling your emotions. She wrote Atlas of the Heart that really goes through and delves into all different emotions that we'll feel. She also, you can't selectively numb your emotions either. And so when we try and kind of seize up and say, I don't want to feel that level of grief or sadness or pain or betrayal, we also numb to joy because you can't selectively numb. And so it really doesn't end up serving us. And the other thing I find fascinating, because you mentioned joy a lot, is she talks about that joy is actually the most vulnerable emotion for us to feel. That one takes more courage than the others. Yeah, it's kind of like, I'm sure we've all had this experience of people saying, get out of here. You're too too fun, too joyful. You're too happy. You know, you're just too much. And so I'm like, no, that's our birthright. We're we're meant to be joyful. And society and all of those things I mentioned earlier, those things press on us to follow the path that we've made for you. And you can't get outside those lines. It's like, don't color outside the lines, Deja Lee. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm going to color any way I want to. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think sometimes people who don't want to be in a place and feel that joy, it's triggering in them 
their fear of that joy or the unprocessed trauma that they have that can't relate to that. And so, you know, and I've been in a space that's been like that before. Like I can identify with feeling that way, but that is really a way that it can help us to see and self-reflect on what could be different in us. I think we all go through periods of fear of the excitement because you we've lived in our lives of when is the other shoe going to drop mm -hmm. and so if you get too happy you're afraid mm -hmm. that something bad is going to happen and almost regularly it will because you've manifested that by thinking that it's going to happen and suddenly something does happen but we also can't receive the joy that we have unless we're open to it and unless you are able to receive it and feel worthy of having it then that joy that you can touch on occasionally is a, a place of fear for you. So you'll jump down, you'll lower yourself down and be in the, the comfort zone of being, well, I'm tentative, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'm in a willingness to be happy, but I can't quite be there and I can't stay there because if I do, then people won't like me, <laughs> you know? And so we, we want to, we want to be happy. And I think that's the way you can do it is by, allowing yourself step by step, piece by piece to move into that space and then just stay as long as you can. And, and it's okay to retreat back, you know, but sometimes you, you got to get up there to, in order for you to understand that it can be, can happen, you know, yeah, and it's a process. Always hope. <laughs> yes. There, there is always hope. Absolutely. Yeah. How have you found community to benefit you? I mean, or do you have in real life communities, online communities, a combination? First of all, we're wounded in community, in relationship. We can't heal outside in an isolated place in our home with nobody around us. We have to be able to interact to know what has to be healed. So for me, I was in search of a community that would allow me to have all my feelings and be okay with holding those feelings, not only for me, but for themselves. Because if I can't have all my feelings and somebody says, oh, that's nice. And then they walk on, it's like, uh, you feel really like, well, as Brene Brown says, vulnerable. And so I'd rather be in a community that is willing and able to hold my space, right? And to have their own. Like if I can be there for somebody else and doing that, that's what I want. So I found this, a friend of mine, Debbie Happy Cohen, who wrote that book called Mother Love. But we, we talked about wanting to have those intentional, loving, supportive community conversations, even difficult conversations that you, you know, you're afraid you're going to lose a friend because you tell her that she has bad breath or whatever, you know, <laughs> you know, we don't want to tell, but, but we really, as a friend, you, you should. Mm -hmm. So we were looking for that and I helped her create the beginning stages of what she's now turned into a really beautiful movement called joy-based living. And, and then the other one that I look for is Kathy Heller's group, which is the quilt and her podcast. And we are all loving, supportive women in that group. And it's just an amazing feeling to have that. And so when I was looking for community, I did that, but I also learned that it's okay to be my authentic self. And so in my own outside community here, you know, I've also learned that what other people think of me is none of my business. <laughs> I love that. So I'm just being my authentic self wherever I go. And I struggle to be myself, right? From the very beginning, because of my history, having had to dissociate so much, I struggled with finding out even who I was, let alone putting myself out there. So I spent 16 years before plenty of audiences in both university and conference and workshops and things like that about healing from trauma and talking about the story of my trauma and then moving forward into the healing process. And that community was supportive. They wanted to hear the story. They wanted to be validated. They wanted to know that they weren't crazy. So I felt really good about that. And then I wrote my new book called Greeting the Day, Wisdom from My Gardens. And I found so many people 
related to the things that I was saying in it, because you gain wisdom from meditation, which we talked about, but also walking in my gardens allowed me to just be quiet with the plants and with the changes in the gardens and with all of the critters that came to visit me. And the wisdom that I got from that, I decided that I was going to send as a, a morning greeting to several women because we were getting inundated with negativity on the internet. So I decided that I was going to put it into an email. And then all of a sudden, somebody says, why don't you make a book out of that? And I did. And I've gotten far more response, loving response from it than from the other books I've written, which were about healing from trauma. But in this book, it also talks about trauma and healing from trauma, but in the way that you find yourself meditating with a thought and realizing that that is a healing it's a healing that's coming from within with that meditation about the idea for instance in my book i talk about foggy days right foggy days a lot of people don't want to get out in the fog for me it's like a blessing to have a foggy day because it's like pulling the veil back from what i haven't seen about myself what i can change in my life what i can appreciate in my life so pulling the veil back in the fog of the foggy day is my symbology there is that now I can look at that. Now I'm okay with looking at that. Now I'm safe to look at that. So that's where I go with my healing process. I still walk in my gardens and I still gather wisdom from the plants and from the critters, you know. I love that. And I love what you're mentioning about meditating and grounding and being out in nature. And I mm -hmm. I often think that like my great grandparents, mm -hmm. it would be so mind boggling to them that we go to a gym to all run side by side on treadmills or <laughs> whatever, staring at screens to move our bodies and we don't go to bed at night and we don't want to get up in the morning and we're so pulled so many degrees away from our physical body and from nature and from all those things. I have a great grandfather who like loved his cows uh -huh. and he would walk this one cow, you know, down to the pasture oh. and back in, you know, like in the Southern Utah. And I think he would just be stunned the way that we live. Mm -hmm. And there are really fantastic things that have happened because of our technology. Yes. You know, I, I love the scriptures and I love books and I love all those kinds of things. And it's mind boggling how many books, both in audio form and visual form that I can have on one little phone and put it in my pocket. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, we still own I personally own more books than anyone that I know that I have seen. <laughs> we still have plenty in print. Mm -hmm. I do have a book buying issue, but we would be healthier and happier if we lived the way people did 150 years ago overall. Mm -hmm. It was physically tiring to go work on the farm or to walk down the street or whatever because we weren't always in cars. And mm -hmm. you had the benefit of physical activity, eating better overall, better yeah. foods that you were more connected to, of being able to get quality sleep, to connect with the community because, you know, like a barn raising and everybody comes to help where the women are all talking together as they go do their shopping. And so many of the difficulties that we have with our mental health and with depression and all of that would be solved just by connecting both with other people, with our own bodies, with, you know, like a more reasonable cycle of life. Yes, I'm very, I'm very grateful for technology. It really frustrates me sometimes, but I agree with you. I was talking to one of my clients today. I'm a coach and I was talking to her and, and telling her to move her body. It doesn't matter if it's like three times during the day, you just bend over and touch your toes. When you move your body, you increase the, the serotonin and the positive hormones that move through your body and you get away from your addiction to cortisol. Cortisol is that negative thing that we all get mired down in the depression and the more depressed you get, the more cortisol, which is addictive and that gets more and more depressed and then you end up being like this. <laughs> so, I mean, I've been there, done that. And it's, it's hard to get away from the negativity and Moving your body, as you were saying that about 
walking around the farm, walking a cow. I think that's so awesome. You know, I do. I love that. I mean, uh, but it is important because even if a person has only a, a tomato plant on their balcony, that's important to feel that or have the smell of the leaves of a tomato plant. They're very fragrant and see the stalk and see that, that it's holding up a lot of vegetation and know that that's symbolic of yourself. You're holding up your vegetation, which is your life. You're holding up your living being, you know, your body is holding that up. And so it's kind of symbolic, but then you can go to a lot of different areas, but nature itself is very, very, very healing. And one of the things that I have done is I had a sweat lodge here for a while. I'm going to reopen it in the spring. And I learned that one of the best places, one of the best ways to ground yourself is to put your bare feet on the ground. That's literal. I go into my gardens and I take my shoes off and I stand in my gardens. <laughs> and that really is a grounding. It can be any time of the day or night. And going out and watching the moon and the stars and the sunrises and all of that. My book is full of colorful sunrises and, and flowers and plants that I've, I have had in my gardens. So. Oh, I love that. Yeah, so it's it's basically a book of meditations, one one page a day. But that's I think it's real important for us to stay with nature because technology takes us away, as you said, away from our body. And the uh, way to heal is to feel it. If you don't embody your emotions and allow them to be real in you, to name them, because a lot of times we, that's why I have this ladder is that we don't know the name. Oh, I feel good. Well, that doesn't tell me anything. Are you enthusiastic? Are you willing? Do you have courage? What is it that you are feeling good about? You know, you know, so I like to actually be able to name the feelings because once you do that, then you can, oh, and open yourself up. You expand yourself. You expand your awareness of your body because you can feel wherever that emotion is in your body. And then you can allow that to flow through that. You can put visualize or to, I would say, put attention, loving attention, gentle, loving attention on that part of your body. That's got some sensation in it regarding an emotion. And as you do that, you can feel it kind of melt away. So for me, that's crucial. Being in, in nature is crucial to be grounding and to also to observe beauty and and the miracle of life. We talk about it, but we don't actually know what that means. You know, we don't actually put it in words. And I think it's real important. This is emotional ladder is about becoming fluent in the language of your emotions rather than just saying, man, I'm so mad. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> does that mean I'm not willing to listen to you anymore? <laughs> or you're blaming somebody for something? You know, there's that there you have to, you know, really distill down what those are and then resolving that, as you said, is the healing. When you re when you have unresolved wounds, you're not you're not healing yourself and you're not allowing yourself to receive the love and the messages that spirit and creator has given you is giving you all the time, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> it really forms a barrier. And one thing that I read somewhere, and I hope I'm getting this right, but that when we have that physical sensation, you're talking about when we feel our emotions, we can identify generally if we're present enough with ourself physically in our body where we feel that, you know, people who are feeling anxious might feel sick to their stomach, or if you're feeling a sense of pride, you might feel it more swelling in your heart. Like there are different places mm -hmm. where we identify that. But my understanding is, is that physical sensation generally only lasts around 90 seconds. That's right. And so I know I, at one point was in therapy and doing some yoga therapy with a wonderful friend, Soraya. And I, when I initially went to therapy, I'd been through some really difficult experiences. And I said to the therapist before she sent me off to Soraya, because she said, you're so not in your body, you can't even work through this. I said, I'm actually not here to feel those emotions. I'm here to learn how to keep going without feeling them. And the therapist was like, that is not how this works. And I was like, <laughs> actually, that's what I'm paying you for. <laughs> like, I'm actually not interested in feeling those really, really difficult things because I've been through such heart-wrenching mm -hmm. 
trauma and heartache. And I don't want to feel that anymore. And she was like, so before any of this talk therapy is actually going to even be helpful, I'm going to send you to my friend Soraya because uh-huh. you need to get in your body. And mm-hmm. if you don't get in your body, you're not going to be able to feel this. And I remember right. Soraya telling me, you are spending hours and days trying to avoid feeling something that's really poignant and difficult for 90 seconds. <laughs> and I was that's like, right. That's exactly right. You know, when you put it that way, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. that's what you're saying kind of makes sense. Uh-huh. I don't really want to feel that, but maybe I can just sit with it for 90 seconds. Yes. Because after 90 seconds, the physical sensation isn't so difficult. Right. And when you've been through something highly traumatic, you might have to go through a lot of 90 second periods. Mm-hmm. It's going to just be a one and done. But every time you do sit with that, you are allowing that emotion to leave your body instead of being stored somewhere. Absolutely. And being a block to future life, happiness and joy and connection with other people. Absolutely. Because when you're filled with all of that, it also is a huge barrier to connection. That's right. Because you're not just connecting, you're not talking about just connecting to your body, but because you can connect to your body, you can connect to others and you can be empathic and empathetic for their emotions, their feelings about what's going on with them. And you can hold space for them when you know what's in your body, when you're, when you're in tune and when you can name it, you know, and then just sit with it for 90 seconds. Like you said, hold space for yourself and for others, right? And then, and with uh, holding space means no judgment. I can't fix it. It's not right or wrong. It's not blue or black or green. It's just what it is. It's your emotion. You have it. You're welcome to it. You have a right to it. And I'm not going to judge it one way or the other. And I find that I was not good at doing that for other people until I learned how to do it for myself. Amen. Amen. And before that, and I'm, I'm going to bring in a scripture story that I love from the Bible, but Jesus had these friends, Mary and Martha and their brother, Lazarus and Lazarus dies. And Jesus comes too late to save Lazarus. And my favorite Bible verse that I tell my kids. And also because I'm like, look, you can memorize this one so fast. John chapter 11, verse 35, Jesus wept. That's the whole verse. And I love that it's only two words, but (laughs) it's easy for Uh them. But I'm like, here is the significance of that. And I'm coming from a Christian perspective, but other people can be coming from, you know, a a very different perspective, but have the same principle. Mm -hmm. um, For me, I feel like when I was baptized, I covenanted to mourn with those that mourn and comfort those that stand in need of comfort, but they're actually two different things. And a lot of Christians and other people are way better at comforting than mourning with those that mourn. And Mm -hmm. so if something happens, we're really quick to be like, okay, can I bring you dinner? Or, oh, you don't have enough money for Christmas presents for your kid. Well, we'll help you or we'll do this or whatever. And, and those are not bad things. No, there's a place for that. But Mm -hmm. I love in that story that Jesus is about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Mm -hmm. He's coming in with this miracle, but he doesn't say, Mary, stop crying. Like I've got it covered because I'm Jesus and I'm going to like, you know, take care of this. And Lazarus is raised from the dead. You'll see what a miracle it is. You'll see that I'm the Messiah. He doesn't say any of that. And I love that just those two words, I think are extremely powerful. They are. They're very powerful. Him just putting his arm around her. And mm-hmm. he just cries with no words and he mm-hmm. holds space for her mm-hmm. grief, mm-hmm. even though the miracle's coming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that is such a powerful witness to me of what I should be doing with other people. Yeah. And that I don't need to jump in with the comfort mm-hmm. yet. Yeah. You can open the door for the comfort, but like, really, there is so much power in just sitting with someone That's and right. holding space. For them to feel what they're feeling without telling them why they needn't feel that way because Uh good things are ahead and the platitudes that we might want to throw out. Like Jesus could have thrown out platitudes at Mary, but like he didn't because that wasn't what she needed. That's right. Just needed to have her grief be witnessed because she loves her brother so much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. You know, what's really interesting is because even though I've done a lot of healing or I had done a lot of healing over the years, different periods of time, there would be levels of grief. And this past summer, I was going through a really, really deep level of grief. I was doing some work with David Bedrick, and he's all about unshaming. And so using language, how does that feel? 
to be ashamed of being told that you were uh, having too much emotion or whatever, whatever that is. And, and what I got was continuous sobbing and I thought it was going to last forever, but you know what? You can't sob forever. You can only sob for maybe 90 seconds. You're exactly right. And then it's over. And then you, oh, you may have another level and you may sob another 90 seconds. I could, I spent weeks in that place of deep grief. And in many cultures, that's a, a person who's grieving is someone who's open to spirit, completely defenseless against the, the workings of spirit in them. I felt very vulnerable and, and seen because nobody tried to stop me from crying and they even shared their stories where they were grieving. And that helped them get through their grief and allow them to be okay that they were grieving and that they were crying and that they were not happy all the time because their family wanted them to be happy. Well, we all want to be happy. We all want to feel elated. But one thing about humans is we're not consistent about anything. And we're not perfect, right? Well, That's we're true. perfect in God's eyes, we're, but we have our own judgments about whether we're perfect in our eyes. So yeah, the the whole thing about grieving, you have to feel it to heal it, is what I say. And in order for you to get through those things and not spend a lifetime in grief, you just have to do it for 90 seconds or, then, 90, or 90 more seconds yeah. until until you're done. Yes. And I love that though you focus on joy a lot and wanting to live a joy-filled life, you are not at all ascribing to toxic positivity. No, no. That idea of like every second of every day has to feel joyful or we're doing it wrong. That's no. actually not possible or attainable. And actually it just leads to more shame. That's not helpful. If right. You well, you know, one of the first <laughs> steps, we have 12 practices in joy-based living. And the first, the very first step is allowing yourself to be imperfect and awesome. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's it really is. Because then you don't have huge expectations of yourself. And you don't judge yourself to be wrong or to be ugly or to be too fat or to be too old or whatever. Those things kind of fly out the window when you're imperfect and awesome. It's kind of like me doing my podcast and saying, well, I'm going to be messy today. Oh, that's so me. I was really hung up on even getting started because I felt like I wasn't going to be able to do it right, that I would pick the right recording equipment or have something or do, you know, or be able to edit it well enough or I don't know, all the things that kind of act as barriers. And I didn't have an offer because in the course that you and I took it, you know, it talks about also monetizing. And I was like, I don't even know, but like what I want to do right now is I want to have conversations. And so maybe I'm not making any money, but if there's an opportunity to make money, it will just come. But I don't want to go into it with that being a focus, but like, I don't have an offer. So what do I do? And a couple of things came together that just really sent me the message like, one, you don't have to have an offer. My offer right now is come and be in my free Facebook group, which is full of awesome women and costs you nothing, but it's a really great community. And, you know, maybe we'll add retreats or other things and maybe there will be some income, but right now that doesn't matter. And then a friend of mine, Ali Duzette, who does a lot with guided imagery healing, She's fantastic. I look up to her a lot and she has tons of YouTube videos. Allie records all of her stuff on Zoom with her being the only one in there, just on her computer in her house. And she actually runs a six-figure business using this and provides lots of tools. I think she could charge a lot more than she does for a lot of what she offers. She has a really good heart. And I was like, oh my gosh. You mean I could just use what I have and not worry about the rest and it won't be perfect here, but we can get started. And then as I learn better and I learn more, then it can become more professional, quote unquote. But for now, let's not let these awesome opportunities to connect and have powerful conversations that help people to realize that they're not alone in feeling the way that there are people who have been through what they've been through or similar things who are finding joy moving forward and who are finding people to grieve with who can hold them up because they're learning about how to be in community, that they're learning how to better reach out to their friends who are struggling, to learn how to hold space, to do the personal healing work that we need to do, that we can all, that 
we don't want to let all of those opportunities go because it can't do it perfect yet. That's right. That's right. A baby doesn't come out of the womb walking. They have to learn how to crawl and they have to sit up and then they may take one step and fall on their butts. And then the next time everybody's clapping, yay, good for you. And that's what we need. We need people in our our cheering gallery, you know, we need cheerleaders that say, go for it, go for it, go for it. And, and each time you do, each time you're affirmed with the positivity that you get from other people, the more courage you're going to have to go ahead. Percent. When mm -hmm. I first set out my original trailer, which then of course is not going to be the one that's going live, but getting feedback from people, not all of it was positive, you know, and for the most part, even what wasn't quite as positive was helpful. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was one person who the feedback really didn't feel very good. And I, as I really pondered over it, I felt like, you know what, though, this is like the outlier. Like it didn't resonate with me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to just let that go. Good, because that's what happens with us as human beings. We have a tendency to out of a thousand people, you have one person that doesn't like you and you focus on that one person. And that's a human nature. But that's what we grow yeah. out of. We grow out of feeling that feeling and saying, hmm, like you, that doesn't resonate. That's that's an outlier. I like the way you said that because that's what happens when you're yeah. actually feeling your body, when you actually have the embodied feeling. Oh, so true. It took me a day to say, well, maybe I shouldn't do this. And then I was like, but look at all these other people who were like, no, I need something like this. Or, oh, I'd love to be a guest and I have something to share or you know, just, there were a lot of things that were very positive. So I thought, why would I let this one outlier person, you know, for whatever reason, she didn't show up well for me that day. And that's okay. I can let that go. Maybe she was having a bad day and that was just where it came out. Or maybe she's just in a different place. But I, I have found that when I took the little bit of courage to kind of put out a post and reach out in the community it has been so helpful to me. And I've been coming out of a couple of years of self-isolating a lot. It's been very difficult in our family. My husband almost died of COVID. And then there have been a whole bunch of other complications and things with some of our kids and my parents' health, my mom particularly, just a lot of things. And mm -hmm. I really went against all of the things I know better about <laughs> and isolated and didn't use my tools. Oh, and yeah feel very good about it. You're not alone. <laughs> it's like, and, and, and I think then I carried a large piece of shame because I was like, I should know better. Like I do know better, but like I couldn't, but I think that it also in retrospect, as I'm learning to give that version of me grace, sometimes I think the difficult things just come too quickly for us. And in yeah. that moment, we actually just can barely keep going. And we have to get to a place of more relative safety That's right. and more relative calm before we can go back and, right. and wrap those layers. And the last thing we need is to beat ourselves up mm -hmm. for not using our tools perfectly well during that time and it's doing imperfect. all the things right. Like imperfect and awesome. <laughs> yeah, we can move forward and learn. So tell me about your biggest life challenges. Oh, well, my most recent one was taking steps and moving more into earned secure attachment out of in, out of codependency and to earn secure attachment. And that's a big one. That's that's like you were talking about, well, we always want to say the right platitudes and we want to bring a dish for, you know, the whole thing. And so I was in the codependency mode and I found that that wasn't being very helpful to me. It was actually kind of harming my whole life. I was, I was being obsessed with things. And so I started working toward secure attachment. And there is, and if you're not born into a family where they affirm you and look into your mother's eyes and you can see an adoration and just joy there, then what you get is insecure attachment. And it could either be avoidant or anxious, either one and all kinds of in-between chaotic. What I wanted was to not be in that obsessive, I want to do, do, do for you, 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 and not for me because I'm nobody, <laughs> you know? So I went through that and I'm really, really happy about moving more into that every day. I move more into it. Like I can have difficult conversations and I don't end up having a panic attack about, I never did have a panic attack, but I don't 
put myself into depression over having a, a hard conversation with someone who says I've done something that harmed them or I've done something uh, that they didn't like or whatever. If they're having a difficult conversation with me, I don't take it all on as, as, oh, I've got to change something about myself. All right. Mm -hmm. I, I'm more into being able to say, oh, that's the way they feel about it. And what about that is true for me. And that's secure attachment as opposed to, oh, I got to be liked by everybody. So it, that was the biggest challenge for me because it's, and it's not over. I'm still moving in more and more and more into that. So I like that I am. I like at my age that I'm still learning, I'm still moving forward, and I'm still finding more things to be joyful about and appreciate in my life. So that's, you know, for me, that uh, was the most challenging thing. If you will talk about my past life, just moving in, out of the, the trauma into being able to operate as one person, that, that was a, a big deal. <laughs> I can remember crawling around on the floor, the cold linoleum floor of a psychiatric ward saying, you know, like, what am I going to do here? And falling asleep right on the floor because I was so exhausted from working what I had to do during that time of healing. And, but that's, you know, that's old, that's past. And it's, you know, that story can be read in uh, some of my other books, mm -hmm. but, um, but to, to get to this place where I am now, it's like a huge, just, you know, like a cavern, like a big canyon wide of growth and, and into joy that feels really good. I love that. And I think that's really hopeful because you're not the only person that might be listening who went through like severe ritual torture kind of trauma. Right. And disassociated, had multiple identities because that is a natural response for the body yep. at that level of torture. Yeah. It's a very a genius way. Our brain can do so many things, which is an interesting thing because your brain can compartmentalize different traumas and yes. make and make you even forget that they it happened. Right. And so, yeah, I, I did split. I had a, uh, and a lot of people are still out there experiencing the same kind of trauma and they do need to hear that this can be healed and you can live a normal, loving, joyful life. Right. I, I remember the last conference I spoke at was the American Mental Wellness Association had their debut conference in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And I was asked to speak and I did. And what I found was the majority of the people with the fancy degrees and the, you know, MDs behind their name were saying that it couldn't be cured. And I was standing there like, what? <laughs> in evidence to the contrary. I think, I think you got that wrong, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I think that most people will buy whatever the doctor says that they need. Like, Yes. Even if it's if you've got a, a a headache, you you think the first thing you want to do is get a pill and get rid of the headache. But necessarily, you might have to sit with that headache for a while and then let it pass. And you don't have to take the doctor's prescription. You can do your own thing and figure out a way to get beyond it. And for me, I actually had some work that I had done with a therapist for about five years, and then she suddenly died. And so I had to go on my own figuring out my own way about how to heal this. And it really had a lot to do, and we talked about it earlier, self-love. You have to allow each of those parts had a story. And each one of them had to be acknowledged and allowed to tell their story and love through it and understand that that was their job was to keep me safe. I'm here because of those parts, you know. Absolutely. And so, so for me, I acknowledge them and I love them. I, I still have great memories of them, but I'm really also very happy that I just have memories of them, that they're not still with me, because that would mean that I haven't healed those wounds of the trauma that happened to me. Which is so fantastic. How did connections with other people? I know I've been hearing you talk about being able to change how you attach to others over mm -hmm. if this has been a long healing journey to mm -hmm. first bring all of these different parts of you acknowledge them love them for the efforts that they took to keep you mm -hmm. and bring them all together and then it sounds like 
that has also helped you to see how you relate to other people yes. and how to be able to change that. Is this just like in your everyday people? Is this people in your family? Is this people you work with? Like, where are you working through these things? Do you have a, a good friend community? Where are you finding these relationships to be healing for you? When they're affirming. I mean, I, I look for people who, you know, you can, you can tell whether somebody's uh, having a surface conversation with you or like us, we're having an in-depth conversation. We're being real with each other. We're talking about healing. We're talking about feeling your emotions. There are other people who that would be the last thing on their agenda. You so know, there would be no way you could have that conversation. So as, as you look at other people, you know who you can talk to and who you can't. And so for me, it was getting out there, risking getting out there. And my my therapist who died, I told you about, she said, write the book and tell people about this. And while she was still alive, I was able to write a book and get on the radio back in those days and have an interview. And it was just miraculous that I was able to do a lot of the healing that I did was through talking. And, you know, that's one, one of the reasons why my podcast is called In My Own Voice, Life In My Own Voice. And that is because you have to use your voice to tell your story. And by being affirmed back, you heal. So when I went and I spoke, like I said, at conferences and universities and different things like that, I was able to, each time I did that, I was able to heal a little more. So that was part of the community. And when I see other people struggling, I recommend different things. Like I might recommend the 12 step program, which I also went to that because my, my father was an alcoholic that I didn't know was, he was a dry drunk, didn't know it, but I went I took on characteristics based on what my environment was at that time. And so I was an adult child of an alcoholic and I was also a friend and family of an alcoholic. So I went to a 12 step group until I didn't need the 12 step group anymore and, and went to other things. So sometimes I recommend that I might recommend that they read a certain book, like one of the things that I mentioned earlier and so those connections that you make as you grow and you do your own healing, you can give that to other people when they ask, or even if they don't ask, you might hold space for them. And then they'll look at you and say, wow, you can hold space or you can be with me. Is it okay for me to be this way with you? And, and they'll know by mm -hmm. your holding space that you can handle them having their emotions. I'm hearing you say a couple of things, but one that you being willing to share your voice, to share your experience with other people, really open the door to creating community around you. Right. Because the people who were able to hear that either because they then really felt like they wanted to show up for you because they were able to hold space for you, or they were feeling like someone else gets it. It was empowering for someone who was really in a place of struggle. That's correct. To be able to hear that and feel like affirmed and validated that their life experience had meaning yeah. and that they weren't the only one, that they weren't alone, that really that speaking up, speaking out, mm -hmm. and then also listening. Right. Yeah. Back in my early childhood, and I think it still happens today, is that uh, we have certain things that we say are taboo. You don't talk about them. And for me, for me, it was about what was going on internally. I couldn't talk about it because I thought everybody was handling it so well. Everybody was supposedly like me and they were handling it so well that if I spoke up, then I would probably be shot. But I was brought to the realization that not everybody had multiple parts. And so they were dealing with life in a whole different way, which I had to learn about that. You know, that was like, wow, who gets up and makes your meals? Who gets you dressed? How do you get to work? And who types, <laughs> you know, I had, I had all those things. You had I had different I, people inside of you, identities, you were doing those different jobs and you're like, wait, there's just one. Uh -huh. of <laughs> yeah. I know. I was like really shocked when I heard, <laughs> when I found that out, you know, like so. but we do have taboos. Like you don't talk about sex. You don't talk about um, your feelings. You know, you, there's just, we, we get into groups and we stop people from talking about things just by our looks or by making a, a snide comment. And to me, those are just anger sideways comments. And if they, if they could deal with 
what it was the person said that triggered them into that response. Pete Walker is another big one that I really like. And he does a lot of work around the inner critic mm -hmm. and how to know if you're in a flashback and how to handle that. Because oftentimes we react over the top at somebody's comment. Like, you know, we talk about the negative comment that we only hear that one. We overreact to that. And that's what's called a flashback when you don't understand why mm -hmm. did you react that way? So you can, you, he does a lot of work with um, identifying those flashbacks and um, what you can do to breathe and get out of a flashback and then get back to, oh, that's what it was. You know, that's. Oh, I love that. I love that way of thinking about it. Cause I would think of that as a trigger, but when you just think of it as a trigger, which I think we're talking about probably the same thing. It's an issue of semantics, but a trigger, then there's no getting out of it or thinking through it. Like it just is, mm -hmm. but thinking of it as a flashback then sets you through like a procedure of like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm actually triggered by this because of I'm flashing back to whatever X, Y, Z, if you're able to delve back into what that is mm -hmm. then it can help you round, you know, the corner to That's why right. am I here now right. and how can I move forward from that? Right. And it right. makes more sense. So that's kind of a more empowering term to use. Yeah. That's and why I like Pete Walker. Yeah, yeah. He's a good, he's a, got some really good work out there. What do you find are the things that have been the least helpful? Like if someone genuinely wants to help, but they're not doing it well, <laughs> what could they learn if they find out that they have a friend who's been through a lot of trauma and horror, but then they think, wow, I don't know how to handle that, right? Like that's kind of a lot. What can they do better? What are they doing that's not helpful? What could they do instead? Well, for me, I advocate for myself. So if somebody is wanting to know how they can help, I will tell them, just sit quietly with me and allow me to have my feelings. I will tell them that. That's all I need. I don't need to be judged. I don't need to be fixed. I don't need any of that. I just need to have my feelings. And that they that feeling, that flow of the feelings will just go, it'll flow, and I'll be done. And also, you know, I think there's that whole aspect of, am I going to be judged for having this emotion? Or are they going to hate me for the rest of my life if I do this or that? And I go back to saying what they think or feel about me is none of my business. It's my business to heal myself. Because if I heal myself, if you heal yourself, if X, Y, Z heals themselves, then we spread ripples out into the world of healing energy. And we affect our environment. When we change our inner view of who we are and how we look at the world, then our perspective rubs off onto everybody around us. And we become a changed person. And because of that, they become changed. So... I see it as ripples. No, I think that's really beautiful. And I think it is really powerful. You know, one person can make a big difference. If one person comes into the room and they have that really hateful negative energy, mm -hmm. it does feel like a draw on the whole room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's where we are. So it's up to the rest of us to hold space for that. And, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. overall, if we are able to work through our own things, mm -hmm. We show up with that energy less and less often because we're not sitting in it. We're not mired in it. Mm -hmm. We're feeling it. We're letting it go. And then we can move on to right. be in a different spot That's and right. being mired in it yes. and bringing that to every room and every situation that we're in. That's right. That's right. So where can people go to learn more about you? Well, I have my website, dejali.com. I'm on Instagram, Dejali Labrie and Facebook. If they want to contact me directly with my email, they can. That's dejalilabrier at gmail.com. So, and they and they can also sign up for my newsletter. So by doing that, they get a, a download every you know few days or a couple of weeks of things that are up in my life and maybe up in theirs and things that they can do to feel better, to bring that joy into their lives, which is about healing. So I'm doing a new website called the healing palette, you know, like the artist palette, because, oh, yes. because we heal in a lot of different ways. You can see the paintings behind me. Mm -hmm. Those are paintings that I did in this healing process. And, and then I do a lot of speaking and I do a lot of writing. So those are three 
different methods of healing that people can use. And so I'm, I'm encouraging people to find ways that will uplift them to bring joy and play into their lives. And then that will, you know, I, I read the other day that if you smile, if you use the, if you're like this and you don't want to smile, but if you just physically do this, even if it's just a small smile, that stimulates the brain to tell you that you're happy and it'll give you the uh, serotonin that you need. Even if you're not happy, if you just move your lips up, then that muscle goes directly to the brain and it'll, and it'll release some serotonin, which is a positive. I love that because I think there are times where we want to feel differently and we're not realizing the tools that are in our body, that That's if right. you can move your body in different ways, you can change the feeling that you have just mm -hmm. by changing your shape. That's right. That's right. That it, sometimes it, it does come not, we want it to come inside out, so to speak, but sometimes it can go outside in by the way that we're just using the muscles in our body. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So well, our, brain, our brain is a, a, a miracle, <laughs> you know, really? uh, it can not only compartmentalize trauma, but can also tell you that, oh, you're happy. I'm going to give you some serotonin. So there's, you know, the brain is just a miraculous thing. And if we are always functioning from the amygdala, which is our safety area, that's our fear. We're in fear. If you're always functioning from there, you're always going to be getting that cortisol. So what you want to do is bring yourself up into this met this area of, oh, I feel much better now that I've gotten that dose of serotonin. Woo. <laughs> I got my good. shot for the day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you can do it in a way that, you know, it's no substances, no pills, no anything like just oh. actually getting some movement. All right. So I went through I went through the healing process from that trauma without any drugs. So you know, I, I real it's not that I'm against people using whatever method they need to medically to get through some things, but I chose at that time to feel my feelings and to allow myself to grieve and do all the rest of it that I had to do in order to heal from the trauma. So I love that you were able to do that in a way that felt right for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there were times there was there were parts of me that wanted to die and, you know, just took being able to find somebody who was willing to hold space for me, which my therapist at that time could. And also for me to find ways that would self-soothe, which was to feel my feelings and let them go, let them go, let them go, let them go. There, that's why I like David Hawkins' book called Letting Go, The Pathway to Surrender. Because for me, surrender means, let me give you an example. As the Native Americans say, be a hollow bone, which means that you your ego steps aside and allows spirit to do the healing. That's really beautiful. So you become a hollow bone for spirit to come down and heal whatever it is that needs to be healed. And that or down that's you know, that's kind of a, an odd way to say it because spirits all around us and in us, but the fact that you can allow your ego to sit over in the passenger seat of your car <laughs> or in the trunk of your car, <laughs> then that's, you know, that's where you, got to put it in order for you to allow spirit to do the healing it needs to be done and guide you you know because you know we were talking earlier about your monetizing and for me it's like spirit will tell you when it's time and what way right so you don't have to force anything in your life you can be who you are be as magnificent and beautiful as you are and not have to worry about monetizing it'll come it'll come Yes, absolutely. Which just gave me all kinds of relief. I thought, well, then I can move forward and do what I really want to do, which is connect with people and right. to inspire other people to keep connecting. So it's... And you do a great job of it. Thank you. I appreciate it. So if you were able to have a gigantic billboard anywhere in the world that like everyone would see this, what message would you want to send to people? My my big billboard is going to be, you matter, exclamation port, point, your joy matters, exclamation point. That's it. I think that's beautiful. Yeah. And do you have one final thought that you'd want to leave with our listeners? Yeah, life becomes better when you feel it and heal it. It becomes much better when you resolve your emotional traumas. And you can see on the other side. And I'm hoping that I'm an example for people to see that they, they can go through whatever hard times they're having 
and still come out on the other side and feel comfortable and joyful and contentment and loving. That's I what love it is. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to learn from you, to connect with you. I think there's just so much to be inspired in your own story of being able to come from a place where you were wounded by other people. You were able to go through a long healing process, but be able to heal that in yourself. And then to be able to find a tribe wherever you go, mm -hmm. in essence, to be able to find those really meaningful connections that's right. and to hold space for other people and kind of turn something that's been difficult. I can't even imagine how difficult I won't even pretend, but to turn that to blessing so many people that we're, we're, we're grateful for you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So, I take that. I take that into my heart. Good, good. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thank you for having me here. It's uh, been an honor. If you have an upcoming event that would benefit from Deja Lee's message, please reach out to her. You'll find contact details in the show notes. Also, if this episode positively affected you, would you please share it on social media or with a friend that would benefit? Thank you for being part of the Solidarity Sister community. Solidarity.